discuss the existing challenge for collapse supernovae patients. Thank you. Thanks to the organizers. And it's great to follow Jack because uh, it's nice to know that some at the bottom level that he's going to be doing a lot of hard work. <laughs> so I understand the charge of this meeting. Uh, and so I wanted to give you an outline of where I'm headed so you understand where I am in each one of the talk, even when I'm focusing on the physics. I want to delineate the physics requirements of the supernova problem. As I said to Richard Klein this morning over breakfast, uh, physics kills, and you'll see why in this particular application. And there's no getting away from it in this application is the problem. Um, and so the physics will immediately translate into computation requirements. That's intuitively obvious, but I'll show you how. Uh, I want to discuss the current state of the art. Um, again, over breakfast, we were discussing where the field is after four and a half decades. And recently, there have been, in the last few years, some uh, significant breakthroughs. So there's been you know, some very good progress made. It's worth noting. Uh, but I'll be the first to point out uh, the, the faults in our approaches uh, and what's required in the future. Um, and I, I think that the faults in our current approaches, again, going back to the computational requirements, uh, at the, in the present day ought to be forgiven, but a decade from now, you know, maybe less so. And uh, then I'll focus on the computational challenges per se, uh, really give you a sense of the scale of this problem, uh, and then I'll conclude by responding to the set of questions that remain and the other organizers have, have given us. So this is an astrophysics audience, uh, so uh, everyone here appreciates the, uh, how basically how core collapse supernovae work and why they're important. Uh, for the non-astrophysics, yes, we have here uh, the core collapse supernovae are the death throes of massive stars, 10 times the mass of the sun or greater, and they're the single most important source of elements in the, in the universe. Uh, they are dominant uh, in terms of production of elements between oxygen and iron and are responsible for half the elements heavier than the moon. So if we're trying to understand our origins, our place in the universe, uh, we, we really have to understand core collapse supernovae. Um, the shock wave, uh, the star's core, uh, after millions of years of stellar evolution, the shock wave, the, shock, the stellar core collapses on itself, um, and it uh, proceeds to super high densities at the center. Uh, Supernuclear densities at the center becomes incompressible rebounds, launches a shock wave like a spherical piston in a system, and that shock wave ultimately must propagate out of the iron core of the star into the stellar layers, silicon, oxygen, and beyond layers, and disrupt the star and core collapse supernova. Event. The fundamental problem is that the uh, shock wave stalls, it's plowing through the iron core. And due to uh, dissociation losses, breaking up nuclei into nucleons, and the loss of particles, so uh, the loss of neutrinos, radiative particles, uh, the shock wave is enervated, it stalls, and the fundamental question uh, to date, uh, which we're beginning to answer, fortunately, is how is the shock wave revived? You have here a schematic, which I'll make ever more complex as the talk goes on today. You have a stalled supernova shock wave. You have infalling material through it. Uh, from in the stellar core, the material, of course, is decelerated. It's dissociated, so nuclei become neutrons and protons. You have at the center this uh, super dense core that's formed during stellar core collapse. It's known as the proto-neutron star for obvious sleep reasons. It'll go on to form a neutron star or a black hole. Uh, this is how neutron stars are born largely in the universe. And uh, this uh, proto-neutron star is radiating uh, neutrinos of all three flavors, electron, muon, and tau neutrinos and their anti-neutrino partners uh, at the staggering rate of 10 to the 52 ergs per second to put in uh, sort of common terms, that's 10 to the 45 watts. So you have a neutrino bulb here. Uh, Jim Wilson, back in the early 1980s, discovered that uh, the shock wave can be re-energized by neutrino heating. We call this the, the delayed shock mechanism, the neutrino reheating mechanism. And the heating is mediated by the absorption of electron flavor neutrinos and antineutrinos on the protons and neutrons that were liberated by dissociation of the material through the shock wave. You have here a, uh, the region splits into two pieces neatly in spherical symmetry. Uh, the, the, uh, there's an 
net heating region by neutrinos, and a net cooling region. Throughout the, uh, this entire region, you have heating and cooling by neutrinos, but it turns out that heating dominates here, cooling dominates here, and uh, basically at the gain radius, gain radius, this circle here, they're balanced. So you have to heat the, uh, the material by neutrinos within this region before it uh, falls through the gain radius and it's forever lost uh, to the proto-neutron star. So it's not just about the heating, it's about the rate of heating. So the, the neutrino luminosity is factored in this very heavily. Um, this neutrino heating paradigm is remains front and center uh, in core collapse supernova theory. And as you'll see later on today, we're making some important progress on actually exploding stars from first principles uh, based on this mechanism that, that uh, our colleague, uh, late colleague Jim Wilson, uh, discovered. The neutrino heating uh, can be simply expressed. It's nice in this problem. Uh, every once in a while, something looks simple. Uh, and in this case, the neutrino heating mediated by nui nui bar absorption it splits into two terms, one for nui, one for nui bar. And it can be expressed in terms of three intuitive quantities. The neutrino luminosity, and it's linear in that, so obviously the more luminous the neutrino ball, the more uh, energy is deposited, the more likely you are to explode the star. The uh, square of the R of mass energy, so this is now quadratic in the neutrino spectra, and that's a very important point. Uh, and uh, the more energetic the neutrinos on average, the more energy you deposit, the more likely you're going to generate an explosion. And then finally, the inverse flux factor. The inverse flux factor is a measure of the isotropy of the neutrino radiation field here at a point, uh, at an instant of time, at a spatial point. The neutrinos are not all propagating in one direction. The more isotropic the distribution of neutrinos, the more time the neutrinos spend in the heating region, and then intuitively the more heating you get. So these three quantities have to be computed, and they have to be computed quite accurately. You're going to release a of 300 times the energy of an explosion in neutrinos. Uh, and so you, one has to, in, in this uh, problem, in this multi-physics problem, be very, very careful about how one computes the neutrino, things in the neutrino sector. The only way to do this, ultimately, is to solve for the neutrino distribution function. And uh, most of my talk, uh, well, all of my talk will be focused on the massless case for neutrinos, uh, where classical kinetics applies. But we know now that neutrinos have mass, and therefore they can mix in flavors, so that's a quantum mechanical phenomenon. And really, at the end of the day, the classical kinetics is just a step toward a full quantum kinetics treatment. But I'll, you know, I'll be kind, and I'll focus on just the classical kinetics today. So in the classical kinetic setting, one has to solve for the distribution function of neutrinos. So at an instant t, spatial location r theta phi, or x, y, z, in this region, we have to compute the spectra of neutrinos and the distribution in their angles of propagation. So you can already see we're getting into hot water here. This is a seven-dimensional problem, six plus time. And the dimensionality of this problem gets worse, and I'll show you how that happens. Uh, and this, at the end of the day, this is what we ultimately need to do. And uh, as I'll show you, this is not just an exascale challenge. This is a sustained exascale challenge. And I remember uh, back at the scales meeting, it was the, the DOE ran a scales workshop back uh, a decade ago to motivate. Uh, this is when everyone was competing at the Terra scale. And I gave this talk, and uh, one of the program managers came up to me at the end of the talk, and he said, you need an exascale machine. And he said to me, forget it. <laughs> You're not going to get one. So here we are, you know, talking about the exascale. So we have to, you know, the science community needs to keep pushing and pushing and pushing, and eventually, hopefully, we'll, we'll have an exascale machine. But exascale is a misnomer, as Jack was showing you. It's exaflops and it's petabytes, and that's going to be a challenge for problems like this. So this is what I refer to as multi-frequency, multi-angle. Uh, but, you know, in the meantime, what do we do? This is not a problem you walk away from and come back 10 years from now and start. So this is a problem we've been working on since 1966. That's the pioneering work of people like Jim Wilson, Sterling Colgate, and others. And we are making progress. It's a hard problem. We're learning as we go. You don't walk away from this problem. You keep working at it. So what do we do now? Well, what we do now, 
Uh, the state of the art now is to uh, use a multi frequency treatment. And in a multi frequency, not multi angle treatment, you basically take the kinetic equations for F, the, the Boltzmann equation, and you integrate out the neutrino angular dependencies. Okay, and what you wind up with is a set of equations, we call them moments equations. And uh, for the uh, conoscenti here, we have you know, M1 models, multi, uh, multi frequency variable at intensive models, etc. You wind up with a set of equations for the neutrino energy density per frequency or the, and the neutrino momentum density per frequency. So, in essence, you're solving for the lowest order angular moments as a function of frequency. So you have the full frequency dimensionality in the problem. As far as the angular dependence, you're basically including the angular dependence in the lowest order moments. And that system has to be closed by your closure prescription. Uh, much like in hydrodynamics, you need the equation of state to relate the pressure, which is a higher moment, to the density, for example. In, the, in these prescriptions, you need a closure, and that's, that's a, a, a challenge in and of itself. So these, this is uh, what we do now, and I'll show you progress given, uh, given that. And because of the dependence on the square of the spectrum, this is what I would regard as entry-level realism for this problem now. Gray treatments integrate out everything in momentum space. In the phase space, which is space plus momentum space, we integrate out the angular dependencies of the neutrinos and the energy dependencies, and we have a gray treatment so here we're basically solving the space three-dimensional, only three-dimensional spatial problem. Uh, and that's fine to illuminate the landscape, but it is not sufficient to come up with a first principle solution to the supernova problem. The problem with gray treatments, as folks who do radiation hydrodynamics here know, is that you have to, uh, the, the opacities, the, uh, the way the uh, radiation interacts with the material depends on the opacities. And in this particular instance, in gray, we're working with the energy mean opacities. You need to know, you have to assume the spectrum of radiation in order to compute those. Since you're not computing the spectrum anymore, you're integrating that dimensionality out. And if you put in a hard spectrum, in this particular instance, you get an explosion. You put in a soft spectrum, you get a dud. You cannot achieve first principle solutions in the supernova problem with gray. You have to step into multi frequency and ultimately, Multi frequency has to be at the very least validated by multi angle multi frequency, or perhaps multi angle multi frequency brings some additional new physics not included in multi frequency that would be essential in this problem. So, this is the heart of it, and it's what makes this an exascale, sustained exascale challenge. So, the um, So, the uh, Boltzmann, the multi angle multi frequency, aka Boltzmann case, has been done fully in the context of spherical symmetry. So, one spatial dimension. Because of in spherical symmetry, you still have one direction cosine for the neutrinos and energy, so it's a three dimensional problem, even though it's spatially a one dimensional problem. And this was achieved in the fully general relativistic setting by Matthias Liebendorfer at, at Al. Matthias is with us today and will speak later. And uh, in the more modern settings, we have uh, Sumi will be speaking today as well. Sumi Yoshi et al. in 2005 uh, did this, and this is from our group again uh, with more modern opacities. So we have excellent representation from the supernova community today uh, with the talks this afternoon. I was very pleased to see that. Uh, here it's a little depressing radius versus time. This is the shock trajectory across uh, stellar progenitors from 13 to 40 solar masses. So once again, it's important to emphasize. Mother Nature produces stars of varying masses, and we have to generate explosions in all of them for those who, that do explode. And you see here, these are all duds. The radius of the shock goes out to a maximum and recedes, and there is no explosion. As I'll show you later, an explosion will look like quite different. The radius of the shock will continue, continue on in. So this, is, this has been accomplished. Um, this was accomplished uh, in 2001. Uh, we started modeling supernovae in 1966. So it took, what, uh, 36 years to get to the point where we could do the multi angle, multi frequency treatment in spherical symmetry in this problem. And it's going to be a long time before we can do this in 3D. Okay? So 
Okay? So this just to frame the problem. Now, obviously, there, there's something missing here. So basically, this, from a physics perspective, tells me that I cannot explode stars by, uh, by neutrino heating alone. That the neutrino heating has to be aided by something. And what would that something be? Well, I need to break spherical symmetry, and I need to help the neutrino heating through multidimensional effects. The multidimensional effects that we know are the most important is what's called a stationary accretion shock instability or standing accretion shock instability. The shock wave is actually unstable in this setting. In two dimensions, it's a flip-flopping mode. And in three dimensions, there's a sloshing flip-flopping mode and a spiral mode. The idea behind the shock instability is that it distorts the shock, and that gives So the uh, so the, uh, the shock instability will distort the shock wave. It gives you a larger uh, heating region. Uh, it gives you it moves the shock wave out to a, a, a larger radial point in the gravitational potential where the inflow velocities are slower. So it gives you more time to heat the material, etc. There are a number of things that it does for you. And of course, you're heating from below. So in the gain region, where you have net heating, you get traditional convection that develops here as well, which boosts the neutrino heating efficiency. These are the most important uh, the multidimensional effects. And we'll see that in a, in a minute. We'll see how these do, in fact, help the neutrino heating and generating explosions. So before I, I go on to show you the results of uh, simulations in two dimensions in particular, and also now beginning in three, uh, with neutrino heating mediated with uh, by multidimensional effects, let me again focus on the physics here and then tie the physics right after this to uh, flops. So here's the Boltzmann kinetic equation for neutrinos in the massless case. This is the 3D fully general relativistic. Everything is here. Uh, obviously, the charge term goes away. Uh, the first term is just the usual time derivative and spatial transport. This just describes how the neutrinos move in space. Uh, this term is very difficult to deal with. It's very tricky. Uh, it, it involves a lot of physics. It's difficult to handle numerically in a conservative way. Uh, the work by Matthias Liebendorfer uh, in the context of spherical symmetry demonstrates that, and we have to basically reproduce that now in 3D. This contains all of the relativistic effects as well as the geometric effects of the coordinate system. So, geometric effects, if I'm using spherical polar coordinates, the neutrino direction cosine as the neutrino moves through the star changes relative to the coordinates. So, that's just a simple coordinate effect. That's included here, and that's always present. It, this includes all of the special relativistic effects, so Doppler shifts, frequency shifts due to motion, uh, we're, we're, especially when we're observing the neutrino energies and angles in the, in the co-moving frame of reference of the, with the fluid. And this includes also all the general relativistic effects, like gravitational redshift, as neutrinos propagate outward in the gravitational potential, they, their frequency is is down shifted to red to the red, known as uh, red shifting, and it's important to note that no matter which frame of reference you choose for the neutrinos, whether you choose the inertial frame at infinity or you choose the co-moving frame moving with the fluid, the general relativistic effects don't go away. You always have this term, so you cannot get away from this term by choosing different frames of reference. Uh, and then finally, you have the collision term, which is, uh, I'll show you in more detail later what it looks like. And this is all the neutrino interactions, emission, absorption, scattering, uh, pair creation, annihilation, etc. And the scattering, most importantly, I want to note that the scattering generally changes neutrino angles and energies. And so the scattering kernels are going to be monstrous in dimensionality and in memory if we include the full kernels here. 
So if I go back to the spherically symmetric case, so this is the lensed out work from the Oak Ridge group, which involves Modius as well. Um, in, in the context of spherical symmetry in one spatial dimension, we've done uh, GR, full GR. We've included all of the effects here included in this term, as well as a complete set of neutrino interactions. And on the next graph I'll show you, this is referred to as GR, full, full opacity run, so full physics. And not, not by way of comparison uh, to be critical, but just to give you an idea of what's happening in the field, there's a very nice piece of work by Christian Ott et al. in 2008 where they uh, basically are building a Boltzmann capability in two spatial dimensions. But it's Newtonian at the moment. It includes just the geometric effects, none of the relativistic effects. And the weak interaction set is truncated significantly. And in the beautiful work, recent work by Sumi, who we'll talk about this later today, I'm sure, Sumiyoshi and Yamada, uh, this is now done in three dimensions. Uh, but again, it's Newtonian. It involves the geometric effects, but it neglects the, uh, the uh, special internal relativistic effects. And again, it's a truncated weak interaction set. So you can see the general trend here, uh, particularly with regard to the weak interactions, and I'll show you why that is, is to move toward truncating some of the physics. And that's fine. These are important steps forward, and from a practical standpoint, this has to be done now and uh, on the cable. Well. But before I do, let me show you that at the end of the day, we can't do that. Okay? So, shown here on the left is uh, shock, shock uh, radius versus time. This is from Lens It Out. What we realize that in a code like Agile Boltstrand, it's, it's exact. And so what we realized we could do to demonstrate the importance of the pieces of physics is we could take that simulation and we could peel away the physics. So all the physics is in it, and we could peel it away. And that's what we did. So the first thing we did, so the full physics run is shown here in black. The first thing we did was go to Newtonian gravity, and that's shown in red. And then the next thing we did was take Newtonian gravity reduction and we reduced the opacity set, and that's shown in green. And then the final thing we did was we took Newtonian gravity with a reduction in the, opa in the neutrino opacity set, and that we took out the relativistic effects, and that's shown in blue. And you can see here that the large variation in shock radius here, this is enormous. This is a factor of uh, essentially 50% relative to about 150 kilometers for the shock. That for this problem is a huge difference. Because at the end of the day, remember, you're trying to set the stage for all of the multidimensional effects, like the accretion shock instability to develop, convection to develop, and the compactness of the configuration, the shock radius to the gain radius to the proto-neutron subsurface, dictates how all of that will develop. So sure enough, if I look here at 130 milliseconds after bounce, uh, I'm precisely at the point where the one-dimensional and the two-dimensional simulations diverge. So it's very easy to argue that, yeah, you guys did this, this is very nice, but this was done in the context of spherical symmetry. What's that got to do with 2D and 3D? Well, it's got everything to do with 2D and 3D because it's precisely in the regime where the 2D and the 1D will diverge where you have the maximum spread here. So the bottom line is the physics sets the stage for everything that will follow in the multidimensional case. And so you cannot get away from doing a full physics model. GR, full opacities, relativistic effects, the whole nine yards. Now, if I, I'm going to show you here, just to illustrate the point, this is the Boltzmann equation for electron neutrinos only, spherical symmetry, Newtonian gravity, and order B over C relativistic effects. Obviously, I've made that reduction here just so I can write the equation on one slide, but it illustrates the point nonetheless. If I look at the Boltzmann equation, and in particular, this is a, uh, when it comes to radiation because of the radiation time scales, and especially the interaction time scales, the neutrino interaction time scales, are so rapid that a fully, a, a time implicit approach to discretization of this equation is required. Now, you can do the left-hand side explicitly, but you have to do the right-hand side implicitly. In this case, I'm doing it all implicitly, and if you do that, 
uh, and you don't assume AMR. You can have adaptivity in radius, but not traditional AMR. Then the, uh, the discretization of this nonlinear PDE goes to basically a nonlinear FDE, an algebraic system, which you linearize and then solve iteratively. And you wind up at root, and that's why I was so pleased to follow Jack at root, the 800-pound gorilla in the room is the solution of a large, sparse linear system. And the system is structured. So I have the dense diagonal blocks that come from the local interactions of the neutrinos and the matter. For each spatial location, x, y, z, I have a dense block. And then the bands, whether I'm in 1D, 2D, or 3D, come from the spatial tree of the core. Okay. So if I were to do the left-hand side explicitly and the right-hand side implicitly, I still am I'm left with these dense, dense blocks. Now, the dense blocks basically come because I'm coupling neutrino angles and energies. And in the spherical symmetric case, you see here the kernel. I have an angle in, an angle out, an energy in, an energy out. In the context of 3D, I have two angles in, two angles out, energy in, energy out. So the dimensionality of these things becomes monstrous. The size of these dense blocks grows. And it's just, as I'll show you, this is, this is uh, the, at the heart of the computational challenge. Aside from it being difficult to compute these things exactly, basically to compute them and then to code them and instantiate them in a code, you know, that's one of the reasons, you know, for, for truncating and simplifying. But at the end of the day, uh, now the machines, you know, we have to truncate and simplify if we're going to do a Boltzmann solution now, because as I'll show you, uh, it will require a sustained exascale machine to do this without such truncations. So that's why uh, we tend to sort of take Boltzmann treatments with simplified neutrino interactions. Um, but, you know, in the long run, we can't do that. We have to, we have to go in and do that. Okay. So I'm going to show you something from the Oak Ridge group, um, and uh, uh, this will also mimic what a mirror of what the Max uh, Planck group is seeing with a very similar approach. The important thing is that all of the physics that I mentioned is important is in these models, and I'm going to show you 2D as well as uh, early 3D. I, I want to point out, though, that some of the physics is handled in a way that ultimately we need to remove, we need to improve. In particular, there's a ray by ray plus multi frequency treatment of the neutrino transport, and in this particular instance, the uh, multi-frequency neutrino transport is handled in a ray-by-ray -ray fashion, where essentially we're solving a set of spherically symmetric problems. Uh, not just one spherically symmetric problem, but a set of spherically symmetric problems, rather than solving a true three-dimensional problem. And for a centralized source, this ray-by-ray -ray approximation is actually pretty good. But at the end of the day, this has to be replaced. So the point is that if I'm showing you results from the Oak Ridge group, and again, Max Planck takes a similar approach, and these are the state-of-the-art simulations in 2D and now 3D right now, and they deploy ray by ray, you understand the, the, the challenges and what needs to be replaced and done in the, in the longer term. So using this kind of approach, we see here the shock radius versus time. We see, we see the explosion in, in this case for 12 to 25 solar mass stars. The, the shock radius, as I promised you, is moving out. Uh, the explosion energies are quite nice. These are robust explosions. In the case of the 15 solar mass model, uh, the explosion energy is of order 1 beta, or 10 to the 51 hertz. That's canonical. So not only are we generating explosions across stellar progenitors, but these explosions are robust. And uh, that's really quite important. And other things like the proto-neutron star, the neutron star masses that are left behind are also between 1.4, 1.4, and 1.9 solar masses. And I won't spend much time on this, but here we begin to compare with observations. These are explosion energies. These are observed neutron star masses. So our predicted masses are in the range of observations here. And uh, some of these uh, models were taken early, too early to really put on this graph. But in the 15 solar mass case, our predicted explosion energy is very close to what's observed. So this is very encouraging. It's not just that we're getting explosions. Uh, across a range of progenitors from first principles, no parameters, but our, our, our predictions, the zero order predictions like explosion, explosion energies, are uh, commensurate with observations. So clearly, we're making progress. This is, the, this is the first time that the neutrino reheating mechanism is proving to be 
successful in first principle models, and the, the, the predicted outcomes are commensurate with observations. So just to give you a quick movie of this, uh, that's the shock wave that formed. Uh, you'll see the development of convection and of the SASE in this, and at the end of the day, you'll see that uh, an explosion is generated. This is very boring initially, but then it gets quite dramatic. See the development of convective flows here. You'll start to see a flip-flopping. There's a, an elegant one mode uh, for the SASE development here. What's interesting is the SASE leads to these uh, quasi-equatorial large accretion funnels that impinge on the proto-neutron star surface. And so the, the key thing here in multi-D is that you get explosion while maintaining the neutrino luminosities from these large plumes that impinge on the proto-neutron star surface and feed the neutrino luminosities. And you can see here an explosion is developing, and you see these large accretion plumes, quasi-equatorial, and, and uh, there's more than one. Here's the second one that will form. And by the way, these, have, these dominate uh, the, the SASE and its induction of these plumes and the impingement of these plumes on the proto-neutron star surface dominates the gravitational wave uh, signals in these models. And so let me show you now early results. This is the same. This is a slice from a 3D model. This is a pilot model that has been run the 150 milliseconds after bounce. We'll see the development of convection. You see here not only some sloshing, but you'll see some uh, spiraling, the M equal 1 mode, in, of the SASE appearing in 3D, which is not admitted in 2D. So 3D opens up new degrees of freedom, and this is not smooth. This is a three-degree resolution, so a lower resolution model. We're just piloting this through uh, to catch bugs because the full model is running now. I think we're at about uh, 30 milliseconds after bounce, and the full model will take about uh, 50 million processor hours to compute. So, and take, take the, these models run over the course of many months uh, to push through. And here is a similar slice from the Max Planck group. They too, in 2D, see explosions, although they do not see robust explosions like we do, but they do see first principles explosions across progenitors. So now it's become more of a quantitative comparison rather than a qualitative comparison, so it's an important step forward. And this compares with uh, their slice from their 3D model at about the same time. So we're getting there, and this is just a, a, a skip over this really, but I just want to point out that things are looking better. I was talking to Richard this morning. Now we have, for the first time, we're producing explosions from first principles uh, without parameterizations across progenitors, and in our case, we're seeing robust explosions. Uh, we do have to do a, a detailed comparison with Max Planck uh, I'll have some of the previous comparisons, detailed comparisons we've done before with them and have published. Uh, and then obviously the, we have to move on to the 3D, and that's the final frontier. So just briefly, the code lines from the Oak Ridge group uh, are, are motivated by this. The Agile Volkswagen continues to be a wonderful tool for us. Chimera is our extant production 2D, 3D code. But ultimately, we're developing Genesis to remove the ray-by-ray -ray and approximate GR uh, uh, we've, we've used in the Camaro models to have a, in a you know, full exact treatment with uh, multi-group variable ending compensor and ultimately both when you the transport and exact GR with singularity avoidance. So a supernova model is based on some components, uh, magnetohydrodynamics, gravity, radiation, and nuclear burning. And then for each of those, of course, we have particular numerical approaches. Many groups do uh, similar things. The 800-pound uh, gorilla is radiation involving the implicit updates and sparse solves, as indicated earlier, and ultimately goes down to the libraries we hope uh, to, to see come out of, out of Jack's group. And uh, nuclear burning for a very detailed nuclear network of 400 isotopes done in situ on the fly. Nuclear burning can actually begin to challenge computationally the radiation sector. So it's not just the radiation that's critical here. We have uh, chemically reactive uh, nuclear reactive flows. If I go to the 800-pound gorilla and I look at the dense, I pull up the sparse matrix again, uh, I'm going to give you, this is sort of a, a lower bound because I'm going to show you just what flops are required for one piece of this, and then, of course, you have other pieces. But if I, pre, if I look at just the flops required to precondition the dense blocks, 
I have the number of bends blocks, the, uh, which is time step, the number of time steps, the number of spatial zones, uh, and the number of, uh, I can't remember what n, oh, n i is, the number of iterations per time step. So that's the number of bends blocks I'm going to deal with in the simulation. The flops per bends block uh, will depend on the algorithm. And so here I've written it as f n n squared, f n m squared, where n m is the dimension of the bends block. So for L U decomposition, F is N M, and you're dead in the water. You're going to be dead in the water with straight up L U. So you have to go use some substructure in here and go to sparse L U, even go down to Jacobi in order to get F much much less than N M to really be viable here. Here in, the, in this, this is the multi frequency uh, only case. And here, F can go up to 160, and of course, I want it to be as close to unity as possible. But even in a multi-frequency only treatment, I'm going to take F hours on the next flop machine at 10% of peak. So even for multi-frequency treatments, the algorithms I choose, which dictate how big F is relative to N sub M, are critical. So that's very, very important. If I go to the full Boltzmann case, then F can range now up to 5,120, which is why with L, and, and at the end of the day, I require four F days per run on an exaflop machine at 10% of peak. So clearly, if I get up, if I do LU straight up, then I'm, I'm 5,000, uh, 20,000 days here to, to run a single run. So forget it, right? So again, algorithms are critical. And I also want to point out that if you were to do a, a Jacobian-based newton prelog approach to this and actually store the Jacobian, just to give you a sense of the, the memory demands, the Jacobian here is 27 petabytes. So that's uh, if the petascale, edis, exascale machine that Jack talked about has 32 petabytes of memory, that's most of the memory. Which means that to run this problem, God help you, you have to run on the whole machine. Okay, you don't you don't want to have to do that. Okay, so very clearly, uh, my approaches are going to get slammed against the wall here. I'm going to get pushed back on storing the Jacobian. Okay, you say, well, fine, then I put whole, you know, compute and whole pieces of them. But the second you start to move away from storing the Jacobian and, and computing and holding pieces of them, you start to you know get challenged on any kind of bulk synchronous models, and you start to get pushed, as Jack was saying, toward toward uh, uh, task parallel models, which I'll, I, I'm glad Jack spoke about that. I will emphasize that as well, and I think for, for us and for everyone, uh, that will be the future. So generally, even if you're even if you're a smart and develop an algorithm that gets around this problem with the Jacobian, any phase space problem, X and momentum space, uh, spatial and momentum space, any phase space problem is going to push the limits of memory and use of memory on these machines. And you can see that very, very clearly here. So let me uh, get to the computational questions, the computational challenge questions that we were asked to respond to. And this first slide really speaks to more of the science side. I'll go through it, and I'll get to uh, other aspects here. So what science cases could be drivers for exascale uh, computing in astrophysics? Well, ascertaining the core collapse supernova explosion mechanism, I hope I've convinced you is one of them. And in particular, determining the site or sites of the astrophysical R process responsible for half the elements heavier than iron is another. And that you have to do A1 first before you can do A2, and A2 brings its own challenges. What is the current state of the art? So I hope I showed you that if I'm showing you what is the state of the art and it's using ray by ray neutrino transport, then we are still limited in our approaches, our fundamental physics approaches, because of the physics difficulty of the problem. Before we even get to the computational limitations of full 3D, for example. So this is uh, this is you know the, the field. We take a very practical approach in this field because the, the problem is so demanding. We do what we can. We do the best with what we can do now and we keep marching forward. What are the challenges? We have to develop a 3D realistic approach to this, including all of the physics, and that is the one that's conservative for lepton number and energy simultaneously. And all of this, as the, the literature on the subject details, uh, is extremely difficult to do. 
Uh, and then obviously, once we've developed this realistic physical approach, we have to develop an instantiation of that approach on these platforms that is, uh, can make use of these platforms optimally to get to the science we need. Okay, so what problems are there now that impede high performance, and which new problems do we anticipate on the way to the exascale? Uh, this kind of, the answer here breaks the problem up into two pieces. There's the node level piece, and then there's the fact that the number of nodes is going to scale up. Okay. So with regard to the node level piece, achieving node level performance is an issue, particularly in a problem like this, a multi-physics problem like this, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then ultimately, as Jack has emphasized, as you go, to, as the as we go to billion wave parallelism, uh, bulk synchronous approaches are likely going to break down, and we have to take a fundamentally new approach, an approach taken by, for example, Jack's group in, in the Magma Plasma software, uh, where you basically have task parallelism, and you manage the, the scheduling of all that in a very effective way. And generally, I think that's that's going to be the answer. What possible solutions are there to this? Well, fortunately, the good news is, in the supernova problem, there's high dimensionality and a lot of physics. So that gives you a lot of opportunity to take advantage of, of things in terms of uh, exposing node-level uh, parallelism and boosting the, the use of these machines and performance. And the bottom line is, you know, you, the compilers alone won't do this, as you guys know. We, everyone begs for better, smarter compilers and for this to be automated, but the, but the compilers are not going to get that much better. So we're going to have to do a lot of this ourselves. That is your source code. You're going to have to write your source code in a way that where the compiler sees what you're trying to do and then deploys that in assembly and ultimately machine language on the machine in an effective way. And so you've got to get in there and you've got to thread and vectorize the heck out of, out of this. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, we have to develop these task-based approaches. This has been done in MAGMA, and by, in MADNESS, uh, chemistry code, and in the UINTA framework for uh, combustion. So people have successfully deployed task parallel approaches in problems, complex problems, multi-physics problems, and we need to continue to do that. What hardware characteristics will an exascale machine most likely have, and how will this impact code development? An exascale machine will have petascale memory. <laughs> That's just, you know, the reality, and it's going to be the reality. Memory is very expensive. So this may actually preclude uh, certain treatments like Boltzmann, depending on your algorithms. But generally, it's going to uh, really challenge the resolutions in the models, particularly for models involving space, phase space, even with adaptive message funding. It's going to be very, very challenging to achieve some of the resolutions to capture things like turbulence in these models. Billion wave parallelism and data movement, as Jack illustrated very clearly this morning, are, are problematic and costly and will require fundamentally to approach this task based approach. What tools, libraries, etc., can we hope to have on these machines? Well, we start with LAPAC, that's our 800 pound gorilla solution. Uh, Open ACC and Open MP. Uh, I, I know there was a talk by someone from NVIDIA here earlier in the week. I'm sorry I missed it. And the title of the talk was What Can NVIDIA Do? Well, I would love to see NVIDIA and Intel play nice and for us to have OpenMP4 with accelerator extensions so that a lot of this uh, work uh, uh, threading and vectorization can be managed in an automated way. Uh, we need uh, node-level debugging, so this is not just for correctness, but for performance, and so we'll need some support also from the hardware side for, to have the counters. And I believe this is a different view of it. Uh, I'll skip over that. I want to acknowledge many collaborators here, uh, some of whom will speak later today. Uh, and I want to especially acknowledge Bronson Messer of our team, who provided a great deal of input uh, to me in preparing the answers to some of these questions. So, the